Thank you, Terry. Wow, I get extra time. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. It's great to see you. I have to just ask, is there anybody here from Castle Comer? Yes, Castle Comer. That's where my ancestors are from, my Healy ancestors. So it's great to be close to home. And somebody's here from Cork, right? My great-grandparents are from Cork. <laughs> it's wonderful to be in the old country. And I truly believe the Holy Spirit does have a plan to move in this beloved land. And this group may not look or feel impressive, but it's better actually when you don't look or feel impressive because then all the glory goes to God. And it will be all the more evident that it was not us. It was him. Let me ask, how many of you have um, seen or experienced in your own, in your, in your body, a healing, a miraculous healing of, from the Lord? Who has, okay, a good percentage of you, maybe 10%, wonderful. How many of you have been an instrument of the Lord's miraculous healing? Like God has used you to pray over somebody and a miracle happened. Raise your hands nice and high. Wow, praise God. A little percentage of you. I really believe that the Lord not only wants to do healing today and demonstrate his power, but he wants to raise up miracle workers today. Are you ready for that? Yes. Praise God. Who said this in scripture? Nothing will be impossible for God. Who said that? Do you guys read the Bible? <laughs> I remember um, in, the, in the early days of Pope Francis being Pope, he, um, he was at a charismatic renewal meeting and he said, where are your Bibles? He said, all the charismatics I used to know always had their Bible with them in their pocket or their purse. They were always carrying their Bibles and pulling them out and reading them. He said, where are your Bibles? Everybody held up their cell phone. <laughs> if we want to be instruments of the power of God, we've got to get deep into the word of God. His word has power to change us. If we're not feeding on his word on a daily basis, our thinking is going to be mixed human thinking with God's thinking. And our power will be diminished. We've got to continually feed on God's word. So going back to that, um, who said nothing will be impossible for God? Jesus is a, is a good guess, but it's not correct. John, no? Somebody got it. A few people got it. The angel Gabriel said that. To whom did he say it? Mary. To Mary. You all know that one. <laughs> he said nothing will be impossible for God. He had just announced the greatest miracle in history. That this young woman was going to be pregnant. This virgin was going to be pregnant with God because nothing will be impossible for God. We have to get that truth into our bones. So could you turn to somebody near you and tell them, nothing will be impossible for God. We have to keep reminding each other of that truth. And here's another one, also from scripture. It's really a variation of the same thing. All things are possible to one who believes. All things are possible to one who believes. Who said that? Jesus. Very good guess. This time it's correct. Jesus. <laughs> to whom did he say it? All things are possible to one who believes. Apostles? Great guess, but incorrect. Peter? Nope. The centurion, excellent guess, incorrect. <laughs> oh, somebody got it. Nope, not the blind man. 
the father of the epileptic boy. When Jesus came down the mountain and, and he, he met this desperate father and he said, your apostles have been trying to cast out the demon from my son and they, and they weren't able to do so. Help us if you can. Help us if you can. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to one who believes. So could you tell somebody near you that truth as well? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Who, who here believes? Any, anybody? About half of you? <laughs> Mostly on this side. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you folks. <laughs> One more time. Who believes? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I think the Lord wants to teach us in these times that we're living in to root and ground our lives in those truths. Nothing is impossible for God. All things are possible to one who believes because the world, my brothers and sisters, needs to know it. I want to share with you the story of a, a healing because I know the Lord wants to do healing today, but he also wants, to, there's so much he has to teach us about healing. And um, so often physical healing goes along with spiritual healing. They, they're interrelated, they're deeply interconnected. And so this woman named Danny, I, I didn't know her, but she grew up, uh, her, her life was, was fine for the first 30 years or so, but she developed uh, this very serious condition, um, POTS syndrome. I think it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And then along with it, she developed some, some other things, um, tracheomalacia, tracheobronchomalacia, and um, one other thing I can't remember. But anyway, the, the upshot was that she landed in a wheelchair, unable to walk, and then eventually she could not breathe without the help of a ventilator. So by the time she was in her 30s, she had to live in a nursing home with people 30 and 40 years older than herself. Her life seemed as if it was over. And sometimes Danny thought about the moment when God created her, and she had this picture, this vision of the moment of her creation, and she saw God bending over a, a trunk or a box, taking out used parts and making Danny out of them, the parts that were broken and that nobody else wanted because her body was so broken. But then um, God brought a wonderful gift into her life. A male nurse at the facility met her, and they eventually fell in love, and, and they eventually got married. They weren't in the church, but God was working in their lives. And one time Danny shared with Doug the vision that she had of her creation. And Doug asked her a, a simple question. He said, did you see God's face as he was bending over and getting the used parts? She said, no. He said, Danny, that wasn't God. That wasn't God. That's the devil. That's a lie that the devil has been putting into your mind that you're made up of the parts nobody wanted. And she realized it was true. She had this identity, this image of herself that she just assumed was true and she realized now that it was false and that God loved her. And she wasn't made of leftovers. And, and their faith began to grow and eventually they they came to the, the church in, in Lansing, Michigan, where they lived, and, and they began to come to church regularly, and God was working in their lives. They got their marriage regularized in the church, and, and then um, there was a parish mission that I was leading, and this was a year and a half ago or so, and they came to the parish mission, and this parish did a wonderful thing, which I had encouraged them to do which was that the last night of the parish mission was a healing service. And I asked the parish, please make the healing service completely open to the public, to anybody who needs healing. 
And that means the parishioners have to invite people. It's got to be something where you're inviting people. This is an opportunity for people to encounter Jesus and experience his power. And the parish took that seriously. And so the day of the parish, uh, the, the, the day of the healing service, the youth group went out into the streets and they literally invited strangers to the healing service. And the amazing thing was that Danny went with them in her wheelchair, attached to her ventilator. She went out into the streets to invite people to the healing service. She was not exactly an advertisement for the Lord's power to heal. <laughs> and it was so brave of her that she did that. And they got to the healing service that night and Danny was amazed to find that this guy that she had invited on the street showed up and he was there and he had even brought a friend. And as the healing service began, there was praise and worship and Danny saw this guy really getting into it and she, she thought, wow, this is not about me, it's about him. And, and I thought that's such a beautiful self-forgetfulness. She needed more healing than anybody there. But she just thought, this is about him. I, I'm just so happy that this person is encountering Jesus. And, and as the healing service went on, I invited everybody, as Terry has done, to just lift their hands up to God like children, like a little, little child who wants to be picked up by their daddy. And, and Danny did lift up her hands to God, and at that moment, she surrendered to God in a deeper way than she ever had. She just put her entire life completely into his hands in a trusting way. And the healing service went on and Dan, one of Danny's friends had told her beforehand, at the healing service, pray big. Pray big. You know what that means? We have a God who's big. So often we pray small. Oh Lord, would you please help me? Please just give me a little bit of what I need. And we, we pray as if our God is small. But his hand is not too short to save. He's a great God. And when we pray big, when we're praying in alignment with him, that's when we see big. And so she, she had that kind of um, approach that night. She was trying to pray big. And, and there were words of knowledge and um, there was a whole team of young people who also gave words of knowledge and, and one of the words of knowledge was um, God is inflating lungs. And Danny felt something like a faucet turn on inside her and she felt like water was flowing down right through her as that word was spoken. And she felt God is doing something. So she, she made an act of faith so often it's when a person makes an act of faith that healing kicks in. Now, if I had known this, I would not have recommended this act of faith. She unplugged her ventilator. <laughs> and normally, within a few minutes, it would become a medical emergency if she did that. But she unplugged her ventilator and she found that she was breathing. She was able to breathe in and out, in and out. She began to cry. She looked over at her mother who was sitting next to her and her mother saw her crying and said, oh, Danny, it's okay. Maybe tonight's not your night. <laughs> and and um, the husband is like, mom, there's a miracle going on. She's breathing. The vent is unplugged. And they all began to realize the, the Lord is he's doing a miracle. He's healing her lungs. And so then toward the end of the healing service when I invited people to come up and give testimony, what is the Lord doing? She said to her husband, let's, let's go up. So he wheels the wheelchair over to her pew and she said, no, let's walk. And she stood up, she, she put her hand on his shoulder and they came up to the front. She later said, I felt like I was floating. And by the time they got to the front, they were both sobbing she couldn't say anything. But Doug explained to the whole congregation 
um, the, the conditions that she was suffering from and that she had been in the wheelchair for 13 years. And she had been breathing only through the ventilator for several years. And the whole congregation saw the power of God and saw that Jesus is alive. He is alive. The world needs to see that. And Danny, for the rest of that evening, I, I saw her a, a while later. She was still walking around. Um, she could not say anything except, this is real. She had a deer in the headlights look. This is real. This is real. She was like a broken record. She couldn't believe it. <laughs> and sometimes when people get healed, you see that, that they, they, um, they can't take it in at first. They are so stunned. They can't believe it's real. And, and she had to try to convince herself it was real. And later on, when they went home, she um, was jumping on the bed. <laughs> She hadn't done that in a long time. And then, I think it was the next day, her, her nurse, her visiting nurse came over and they decided to play a trick, so they put Danny in a wheelchair again. <laughs> and then all of a sudden she stood up and started walking, practically giving the nurse a heart attack. <laughs> and ever since then, the two of them have been like dynamite exploding. They've, they've gone through the encounter, well, they're now in their second year of the Encounter School of Ministry, and they are evangelizing, they're praying with other people, they are so full of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord is doing such a powerful work in them and through them. They are living testimony that Jesus is alive. And my friends, the world so desperately needs that kind of testimony. Because the, the time that we are living in is a time of crisis. It's no exaggeration to say that. I, I know you see it, you feel it here in the church in Ireland. You've been in a time of collapse, right? And, and in many ways, the U.S. is just a few years behind Europe in that regard. But we see faith collapsing. And we see a world descending into chaos. A world returning to the paganism and the spiritual darkness of the past. The, the darkness that was overcome by the light of the gospel. People are going back into it and putting themselves back into spiritual bondage of all kinds. We live in a culture that is pushing God to the margins, saying to God, thanks but no thanks, we'll take it from here, we'll do it our way. And a culture that banishes God is a culture of a spiritual emptiness, a spiritual void, and, and a, a vacuum has to be filled, right? So people are trying to fill that void with whatever they can. People are, are desperate to fill the emptiness inside. And so we live in a culture of narcissism, where the highest value is placed on self. It's all about me. You know, here's, 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 here's me, and, and here's the world. It's all about what makes me comfortable, what makes me happy, what makes me fulfilled, what makes me attractive or sexy or successful or whatever it might be. And a culture that exalts self as the highest value has no place for self-sacrifice, self-gift, loyalty, commitment, Love, steadfast, enduring love. So it's no wonder that we live in a culture of the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of marriage. So many people have grown up not experiencing stability and peace and order in the family. And that in turn leads to tremendous brokenness. How many people are walking around with deep interior fissures because they, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they've come from. 
They have no idea what life is about, what their destiny is, or how to get there. And they're walking through life like spiritual orphans with no identity, no sense of purpose, no, no sense of who they belong to, what their mission is, and how to carry it out, or even what love actually looks like, and how to find it. We live surrounded by the walking wounded, spiritual orphans. You all have identity politics here, right? <laughs> Loud and, and clear and strong. How many people are desperate to, to find some identity, some segment, some population that they can identify with and put their whole identity into it? Because they're spiritual orphans. They have no idea that they have a loving father who knows them perfectly, who chose them from before the foundation of the world and who loves them absolutely unconditionally. People have no idea that that's the case. And so uh, th this world is becoming more and more broken as people turn away from God and it's, it's rushing toward the precipice. As, as the human race decides that we can control ourselves, we can redefine ourselves however we want, we can redefine marriage, the family, man and woman, male and female, human nature itself. Transhumanism is coming down the road. You know, the transgender ideology is not even the end of, as bad as, as that is, as it, it's not where it's ending. We're, we're heading toward the precipice. And at the same time all of this is happening, the church has been, for so many, has disappointed them. So many are disillusioned, heartbroken, because we, we, we've seen the, the crisis of clergy sex abuse, the crisis of um, a, a church that does not seem able to clearly preach the gospel with joy and courage. Many people are angry at the church, right? I know that's the case here. I mean, it's the case in the U.S. as well, but I, I think maybe even a little bit more here, people are deeply angry at the church. People are deeply disappointed at the church. So we're, we're living in challenging times, right? Yes. Thanks be to God, hallelujah! <laughs> Because we're living in times when we can truly be disciples. We are living in times where it's no longer comfortable to be truly a Catholic Christian, which means truly on fire for Jesus Christ, sold out for Him, putting all our energies, all our trust, in Him. For generations before us, it was, it was comfortable or at least semi-comfortable to be a Christian, to be a Catholic, although the church has suffered a lot in this nation. But we are once again entering into a time where it's going to become very uncomfortable to be a Christian. In, in the U.S., a book came out a few years ago that is, I think is a, a very prophetic message for the church. It's called From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. And, and what the book says is basically, for many centuries the church lived in Christendom. Christendom means the whole society is basically Christian. The whole society, of you know, Europe particularly, North America, for many centuries, was basically a Christian society, I mean, failing in, in some ways, imperfect, but basically a Christian society upholding the values of the gospel. The church's institutions were strong and powerful and influential and highly respected. The church had its 
schools, it's hospitals, it's, it's many institutions, and they were seen as pillars of society, and the church was highly respected in whatever it said. And, and in this book, the, the author, who's an anonymous author, he basically says, that's gone. It's gone, and we're still living as if it's there. <laughs> it's collapsing before our eyes. We are re-entering the time of apostolic mission. We are back in a situation like that of the apostolic church. In fact, our situation is more like that now than it has been at any time in between. We are back in a kind of first century situation where the church is a, is a small minority, the, the, the church as it fully is meant to be, alive in Christ, is a small minority in a very hostile culture. And where the, the, those who, who know Jesus, those who are filled with his Holy Spirit, have an incredible dynamism to proclaim Christ to those who don't know him. In the midst of a essentially pagan culture, a hedonistic culture, desperately pursuing sexual pleasure, power, and possessions. I mean, that was the ancient Greco-Roman culture into which the gospel exploded like a bomb. That's the time we're living in now. And so the church has to, as, as disciples of Jesus, we, it's a new situation. We have to take on new virtues, a new attitude, a new disposition, a new approach. And what an incredible privilege that we live in these times that we're in now. As, as Terry, Terry yesterday was mentioning the book of Esther, and that's a book I've been preaching on a lot lately. The book of Esther was in a time where the Jews were in exile in Iran, and they were about to be the, the subject of genocide. They were about to be destroyed as a nation. And Esther, a little Jewish girl, ends up in the court of the king, in the, in the harem of the, the king as a queen, his chosen queen, and her uncle says, you, you, you got to go and uh, tell the, the king to put a stop to this. Don't, don't destroy our people. She says, I can't do that. Anybody who goes into the presence of the king without being invited gets killed. I can't do that, sorry. I can stay under the radar. Nobody needs to know I'm Jewish. Nobody needs to know I belong to God. It's too, it's too dangerous. I'm not going to make myself know. I'm not going to take that risk. How many Catholics are kind of like that? I can stay under the radar. You know, nobody has to know I, I take my faith seriously. I'm just going to go along with it. And there's a lot of pressure to go along with the agenda, the sexual agenda, especially of our culture, right? So that's her attitude. I, 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 sorry, sorry, uncle. I can't, I, I can't, it's not my fault. Sorry. And he writes her a letter, and he says, if you don't act now to help us, God will send help in another way, but you will be destroyed along with your people. And she's convicted. She decides to do it. And in this letter, her uncle says, who knows but that you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Why do you think God has raised you up to be in the royal court, to become the queen of an empire? Who knows but that you have been put, brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. And the Lord says that to you, brothers and sisters. Who knows but that you have been brought into the kingdom, the unshakable kingdom the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ for such a time as this. You're alive on earth and you've met him in some way, whether, 
it's through the charismatic renewal or in some way the very fact that you're here means you something has drawn you you've met him you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this thanks be to god thanks be to god that we we are called to be disciples in the truest sense by the challenges of our time saint ignatius of antioch was martyred in the arena in rome in the early century, uh, second century and, and he wrote letters to the churches as he was on his way to Rome to get killed in the arena. And uh, he told them, don't, look, don't try to pull any strings and get me out of this. Because now I will truly be a disciple. Now I will truly be dis a, a disciple of Jesus. And as I'm being ground up by the wild beasts, I become the pure bread of Christ. He was even saying, you know, I've celebrated the Eucharist, I've, I've eaten and drunk, but now I become Jesus. Now I truly become a disciple. What amazing words, what courageous words. Thanks be to God that we can truly become a disciple. So the, the, the resistance to God, the hostility to God in our culture which leaves a spiritual vacuum, which then leaves a landscape littered with woundedness, brokenness in many ways, casualties of the culture of death. The ironic thing is, who picks up the casualty? Who, who takes care of the wounded? Who takes care of all those broken by the absence of God? God's people. Who lifts up all of those who have been hurt by the rejection of God and its consequences, God's people, that's us. Even if we're persecuted, we are persecuted, reviled, insulted, mocked, it's our job to pick up the casualties, to take care of the wounded in body, mind, and spirit. So we have to become deeply convinced of the Lord's power to heal. And that's one of the main messages I've been sharing for the last 10 years. 10 years ago, the Lord led me to really study his healing. I had a sabbatical semester, and that means you get extra time to research a particular area of your field and I really felt like the Lord very specifically told me, I want you to study my healing. And I want you to not just read about what people have said about the Lord's healing in scripture, tradition, lives of the saints, etc. But I want you to see my healing. I want you to see it firsthand and understand. And so during that semester, I, I studied what scripture teaches about healing. I studied the tradition of the church, the teaching of the church, the lives of the saints. But I also spent time in Brazil on a mission with a wonderful Protestant healing evangelist named Randy Clark. Have you heard of Randy Clark? He's, he's, he's a real, um, just amazing disciple of the Lord. And he takes big teams of people to Brazil and other countries and basically, everybody who goes on these missions gets launched <laughs> themselves. <laughs> and so I, I went to Brazil, and it was two weeks of living in the supernatural. Every day we saw miracles. We saw conversions. We saw people's lives radically changed. We saw the Lord show his power and show his glory. And I became absolutely convinced God wants this in the Catholic Church. Amen. This is not an import from Protestantism. This, this is not something aberrant or something marginal. This is our apostolic heritage. <laughs> Healing and the power of the Holy Spirit. It belongs to us. It belongs to all followers of Jesus. 
And it's actually only the modern church that has come to think of miracles and healings as something strange and peripheral and yeah, sure, in the lives of the saints maybe or at Lourdes maybe, but you know, not something that we should ever expect. And who am I to think God would do a miracle through me? That modern attitude is the aberrant attitude. So the Lord is bringing his church to rediscover what belongs to our heritage and to live it and practice it. So thanks be to God for encountering Christ. Thanks be to God for Encounter Ministries in Michigan, which now has a branch here. Thanks be to God to, for all of those who are carrying that torch and helping, helping the church come alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to share with you a little bit, just a little bit of what I found in Scripture as I, I delved into healing. First of all, a verse that I had never really noticed before that really struck me is in the book of Exodus. And it's after the great miracle of the Red Sea. God has led his people out of slavery in Egypt. He's shown his power, all the plagues against Egypt. And they get into the desert. They're about to spend some quality time with God in the desert. And the Lord speaks to them this beautiful word. He says, I am the Lord. I love the musical accompaniment. <laughs> I am the Lord, your healer. I am the Lord, your healer. Maybe you could all um, just say to somebody near you, the Lord is your healer. So God, in that passage, is giving himself a new name. He's revealing something new about himself. God is saying, you cannot separate healing from who I am. It is my personality, my character to heal, to bring my people whom I created into the fullness of life I always intended for them. I am the Lord, your healer. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh Rofecha. Such an incredible revelation of who God is, that his very nature is to heal us. Well, Israel didn't always experience that healing power of God because so often they wandered away from him. They did their own thing. They worshiped idols. They worshiped false gods and they experienced the negative consequences of that. Hard to imagine, right? Or maybe not. <laughs> and so they didn't experience the healing power of the Lord, but just the opposite, the brokenness that comes from worshiping false gods. And God then sent them prophets who told them, don't be discouraged. Don't give up because the Lord will send you a Messiah who will save you from everything that keeps you from the fullness of life that God intends. And the way that Messiah will be known is by his healings. In that day, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. I've seen all those things, by the way. It's amazing. It's amazing to see the Lord open eyes uh, that were blind or partly blind, open ears that were deaf or partly deaf, make lame people like Danny walk again and leap for joy and uh, tongue, the tongue of the mute sing for joy. So. God gave those promises through the prophets. And then what happened when Jesus came? He was baptized in the Jordan River. He began his public ministry. 
He began it, according to the Gospel of Luke, in the synagogue at Nazareth. He gave his inaugural sermon. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bring liberty to captives and the opening of the eyes of the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor. In other words, I am Yahweh Rofecha. And I am bringing you good news to the poor, which is the whole human race. Good news, not only in words, not only a beautiful, consoling message. Like there's hope for some time to come. But in power, in reality, Jesus is saying there, my good news that I bring is not good news without power. The gospel is not good news without power. Without power, it's not good news. How often has the church preached a gospel without power? And it's no wonder that people don't see it as good news. It leaves them exactly the way they were before. That's not the gospel. I like to use this example. Think of a dungeon underground, a horrible dungeon, where people are, hundreds of people are chained up. And it's dark, it's dank. I, I've been in some castles around here, actually, they actually have those, <laughs> right? A dungeon, torture instruments, and people down there would be in, in the cold and, and the darkness, they're starving, hungry, covered with lice. I mean, e every horrible thing you, you can imagine. It's really the image of humanity without God. Even when they look like everything's fine. They're in that kind of bondage and darkness and sickness. Imagine somebody walks in there and says, Hello everyone, I have good news. There's a savior who has come to set prisoners free. Just wanted you to know that. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> and he walks out. Is that good news for those people? No, of course not. It'd leave them even more miserable than they already were. It might have, you know, stirred up hope and then he's gone. They're still there. That's a gospel without power. What would be needed to make it good news for those people? Open the doors, break the chains, let them out of there, heal them, fix them up, then it's good news. That's the gospel Jesus preaches. It's not good news without power. And we have to stop proclaiming a gospel without power. Well, Jesus said that in his inaugural hom homily, and then he, he, he did it. He, he proceeded to do it. And everywhere he went, he proclaimed good news. The kingdom is here because the king is here. And he demonstrated it. He didn't just say it. He demonstrated it. The kingdom is here. The reign of sin is broken. The effects of the fall. You know, sickness. Catholics have so many mistaken, kind of like half-truth ideas about sickness. So many people think God sent me sickness. If I'm sick, it's because God sent it. God wants me sick. I don't deserve to be well. Ever heard or seen or had that kind of view? It's pretty, pretty widespread, right? Well, good news, God didn't send sickness. <laughs> God is not the sickener. He didn't say, I am the Lord, your sickener. <laughs> he said, I'm the Lord, your healer. Sickness came into the world because of the fall, because of sin. Ever since then, God has been trying to undo the fall. 
So everywhere Jesus went, he healed. He opened blind eyes. He opened deaf ears. He made lame, the lame walk. He made lepers cleansed. Everywhere he went, he proclaimed his gospel, not only in words, but in deeds of power that demonstrated that the words were true. So one of my favorite, or actually, but let me ask, how much time do I have? Until? <laughs> Until quarter two, okay. Are you guys okay with that? I mean, hard seats and everything. All right, all right. Um, one of my, my favorite healing stories is the healing of the leper. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but um, the version I like is in Mark 1, um, verse 40, starting in verse 40. Mark 1, 40. A leper came to him, and kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. It's a very poignant scene because everybody in that culture knew a leper shouldn't be there. A leper is not allowed to be in a group of people because according to the law of Moses, everywhere a leper went, he had to stay apart from other people wear torn clothing, a sign of mourning, and hold his hand over his mouth and shout, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine the shame, the humiliation, the loneliness? Do you realize how many people around us today feel like a leper? They don't have to shout unclean, but they feel that same shame and loneliness and isolation. So we can, we can wonder, we can ask the question, but why, why would the law of Moses be so harsh, so mean, toward people already suffering a horrible, deadly, contagious disease? with oozing sores and you know, limbs rotting and falling off you. Why would the law of Moses be so harsh? It's exactly here we see the limitations of the law. The best that the law can do in the face of a deadly contagious disease is put some limit on it, to contain it to some degree. Create a quarantine. You know, post-COVID, we have an idea of what that can look like, right? That's the best that the law could do. Do you know it's the same in regard to sin? The best that the law can do is contain it to some degree by commanding, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. But the law cannot heal. It cannot heal a leper. It cannot heal the heart of a sinner. Yes, the law is good. It's, it's from God. But it's so limited. The law cannot heal. But Jesus can. And he came to do what the law cannot do. How many Catholics have been living a version of Christianity based in the law. They don't know the power of God, they only know the law. It's an Old Testament religion. There are a lot of Christians living in an Old Testament religion. It's not that it's a battery, it's, it, it's a gift of God. But it's so limited, it's not the fullness of what he came for. And so this leper, he's taking a risk to be there. So often in the gospel you see faith involves a risk. How do you spell faith? R-I-S-K. <laughs> That's how you spell faith. Because if it doesn't take a risk, if it's not willing to take a risk, it's not real faith. That guy took a risk to be there. He could have been rebuked, he could have been rejected, he could have, people could have been revolted by the sight of him. 
How many of us are in that same position? I know he can heal me. He's um, the omnipotent God. I doubt he wants to. How many feel unworthy? We know how we've failed the Lord. We know how we've, we've messed up. So, I know he can, but I doubt he will. So often that has to be overcome in people's hearts before they are willing to open themselves to the Lord. As in, in the case of Danny that I told you about, she needed some inner healing to begin before she was even ready for the big miracle the Lord wanted to do. If you think God made you out of used parts, you're not going to be, believe that he wants to heal you. So that the leper is in that position. And Jesus looked at him with compassion. It says he was moved with compassion. In Greek, it's a word that's hard to translate. Moved with compassion. It's one word, esplachniste. It means literally Jesus had a visceral reaction. He, he was gut-wrenched. You see the human emotions of the Son of God. What motivated Jesus to do all the healings that he did? Sometimes we think, well, to prove he really is the Son of God. And, and it's true, the, the miracles do prove that, but what was the motive that the Gospels show us? Is compassion for, the, for this desperate person suffering in front of him. That compassion still moves his heart today. If we want to be used by the Lord for healing, we have to take on, share in his gut-wrenching compassion for the sick, the wounded, the broken. As Paul says, faith works through love. Our, our faith will, will not increase unless we are willing to let our hearts be moved with love. I, I, like, I love this prayer. Lord, let my heart be broken with what breaks yours. Lord, let my heart be broken with what breaks yours. And to pray that prayer and, and see the Lord begin to answer it is painful. It's painful because we're really entering into the, the suffering, the brokenness of a world without God. But it's in that compassion that his power moves. So Jesus was, he was moved with compassion and he said to him, I do will it be made clean. I do will it. Just imagine hearing those words. We, we need to gaze into the eyes of Jesus. What, what was in his eyes? What, what was the look on his face when he said that? I do will it be made clean. I, I just, it's, to me, it's as if Jesus was saying, you wonder whether I want to heal you? Don't you realize it's my joy to heal you? Don't you realize this is why I came? The is, do you want to heal me? 
in the lecture. Oh, okay. Okay, that's your Jerusalem Bible translation, right? <laughs> Which I'm not used to. Of course I want to! Yeah, that's the meaning. <laughs> that's what he, he says. Of course I want to. This is why I'm going to die on the cross for you. To free you from sin and all the effects of sin, all the brokenness of the world from the beginning to the end. I do will it be made clean. And as the, the, the crowd is watching, you can imagine what's going on in people's minds as they're, they're watching this whole thing unfold. Jesus reached out and touched him. And you probably would have heard a gasp. <gasps> Look at that. He's going to touch a leper. And everybody in that culture knew, you don't do that. Because a, a, a leper is ritually impure. What happens when you touch a ritually impure person? You become impure. You become unclean. That's the way the ritual purity laws worked. If the clean touches the unclean, it becomes unclean. Like if I have a bucket of clean water and a bucket of dirty water and I pour them together, what do I have? Dirty water. That's the way it worked. Jesus reached out and touched that guy. And all of a sudden, the ritual purity laws are overturned, just completely capsized. Instead of the unclean overpowering the clean, the clean triumphs. Jesus' cleanness is more powerful than anybody's uncleanness. It's a powerful message for anybody who feels too unclean to approach Jesus. And a lot of people do. A lot of people feel too unclean to approach him. But nobody can contaminate Jesus' cleanness. Nobody can overcome his, his cleanness, his holiness. It's invincible. Well, you might ask, well, how do we know? How do, how do we know Jesus didn't become unclean by touching him? Very simple. Because the guy's not a leper anymore. <laughs> He's healed. It's visible to everybody. Everybody can see he's not unclean anymore because his skin has been perfectly made whole. And I picture the guy looking at his hands and his legs and he is realizing his skin has become like the skin of a baby. And he has that deer in the headlights look. <laughs> probably stunned. And then probably when he began to realize it, he began to weep. And probably everybody watching him began to weep. Because a healing is a revelation of God. Anytime you see a healing before your eyes or you experience it in your own body, it's a new revelation of how good God is and how powerful he is and it changes you i've been so blessed to see so many healings i tremble because to whom much has been given then much is required but i think it's is because of the times we're in the lord is pulling out all the stops and he's making it very evident my gifts of healing and miracles and powerful gifts of the holy spirit are for anybody who will open themselves to them and become my ambassador, my evangelist, to bring my power to the hurt, the broken, the sick, the lost. The Lord loves to heal far more often than we think. And so, so that guy is, is healed, is, is, he's got his life back. He can, he can re-enter human society. He can be with his family again. He can be with his friends. He can even enter the temple once again and, and worship God. It's amazing. He must have been filled with joy. And Jesus kind of dumps a bucket of cold water on him and says, shh, don't tell anybody. Does that ever seem strange to you? That after many of his miracles, Jesus gives this command to silence. Keep it quiet. 
And unfortunately, that, that theme has been often misunderstood, drastically misunderstood. It's called the messianic secret. When Jesus tells people to keep it quiet, why, why did Jesus do that? Aren't we supposed to spread the good news? Yes, but we have to understand it in the context of the time. During his earthly life, the great danger was that people would drastically misunderstand Jesus' mission as a political, military mission to overthrow the Roman government. And Jesus had to reveal in his own time and his own way, look, fellas, my mission is to be rejected and suffer and die and rise from the dead. That's what it means to be the Messiah. Total shock, total you know, counterintuitive, totally different from anything they expected or understood. Jesus had to reveal that in his own time. And that's why during his earthly ministry, he told people to keep it a secret. But we also have to understand that once he did complete his mission and die for us on the cross and rise from the dead, the time for the secret is over. 2,000 years later, I'm not sure all Catholics have gotten that memo. <laughs> the time for the messianic secret is over. When you experience a healing or a miracle, or a mighty work of God, or a prophecy that comes true, or the, a word of knowledge, or prophecy that changes your life. God has given you that as a gift for you, but also so that you can tell people about it, so that you can bear witness to it for the glory of God. Beware of stealing the Lord's glory. I mean, there's something serious about when, you know, I, I know of people who, for even self-centered reasons, have refused to tell anybody about a miraculous healing they got. Now, every once in a while, there can be certain legitimate reasons, but for the most part, we are meant to bear witness, to testify to the Lord's works. Now, Jesus said to this guy, don't, don't tell anybody, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. Well, it's very interesting if you look up what Moses commanded for the healing of a skin disease. It's in Leviticus 14, if you want to look it up. You take two birds. One gets sacrificed, and the other um, it is dipped in the blood of the first and flies away free. Do you get it? If he did what Jesus told him to do, he had a powerful image before his mind of what Jesus had just done for him. Maybe he, he couldn't have understood it then, but maybe after the cross, he understood. One is sacrificed, and the other, dipped in his blood, cleansed in his blood, goes free. That's us. It, it, it's an image of the fact that every healing that Jesus does comes at a cost. But he's already paid the cost. It's a cost to himself. The highest possible cost. The blood of the Son of God. That means that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, not only did he take upon himself all sins of every human being, that all sins ever committed from the dawn of history till the end of time, but all the consequences of sin, all the brokenness, all the ugliness, all the sickness, the darkness, the lies, the deceptions, the bondage, he took it all and he nailed it to the cross so that we could be set free. He's already paid the price. Nobody should think, I can't get a healing until I'm worthy. 
Because that's like saying, I'm going to make myself worthy. I'm going to earn my healing when I do enough spiritual push-ups. That is to belittle the blood of the Son of God. We can never be worthy, but he makes us worthy by paying the, the price of his own blood. And so um, the man uh, told by Jesus, shh, don't tell anybody, he went out and told everybody. <laughs> And you can understand, he was just so excited, he couldn't, he couldn't keep it to himself. But the result is interesting. It says, because of that, Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. Notice what just happened. Jesus has just traded places with a leper. Now, the leper is free to mingle among people, to be fully human once again. And Jesus has become the outcast. It's another sign of what he does for us. The price he was willing to pay. The Son of God said, I will be the leper in your place. Because we were all the leper. We were all broken, alienated, isolated, ashamed, and we all still experience to some degree the, the consequences of sin. Jesus said, I'll be the leper in your place. Let me take your sickness, your garbage, and I'll give you my life in exchange. It reminds me of a little testimony I heard once. Somebody who came to a charismatic conference and he was a garbage collector. I don't know what you call, what do you call them here? Vit man? Bit man. Oh. <laughs> okay. He was. Oh, bin man. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Bin man. <laughs> That's funny. He was a bin man. And he was feeling uncomfortable in this conference because everybody else seemed to be like a more white collar person. Um, and he was the only kind of blue collar. I don't know if those expressions make sense to you. Okay. Um, so he was feeling uncomfortable, and then all of a sudden Jesus spoke a really clear word to him. I'm in your line of work. I'm a bin man. <laughs> Jesus is a bin man. <laughs> Did you know that? I'm going to go back and tell Americans, Jesus is a bin man. They'll be like, what? <laughs> He's a bin man. He loves to take our junk. He loves when we give him our junk. So we, we must not be afraid. We must not be ashamed to give our junk to Jesus. He loves collecting it. He's, he's, he's already brought it to the dump on the cross. And he loves to set us free. All right, it's time for a break.